The guy with the plan, the man with the plan, Brent Johnson, and I think he has the clearest vision of the future. So I want you to pay attention. I don't care where you live in the world, because I think Brent has as clear a vision of the future as possible. Essentially, what I think has happened over the last 10 years and what I think is going to happen over the next few years is that the world, after the financial crisis, the central banks just got together and just printed and printed all this liquidity. And that went on for six or seven years, five or six. And at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, the U.S. stopped mixing the milkshake and we started raising interest rates. And the raising of the interest rates from 2016 to 2019 combined with a number of other factors. It's not just interest rates, but interest rates were a big factor. And the fact that our interest rates, while they've come down a lot, are still higher than you know Japan and Europe who have negative rates. That, along with these other factors of having the global reserve currency system, having the, the dollar payment system, having the largest U.S. military, having the deepest capital markets, all of that stuff acts as a straw which sucks up all the liquidity that the world is printing. At the end of the day, whether you like the dollar or whether you hate the dollar, whether you think it's a good currency or a horrible currency, the fact of the matter is it is the currency which the world runs on. Right. And so even if you hate the dollar, if you live in Argentina or Turkey or China or Brazil or France, you still need dollars to operate on the world stage. Now, I think there's a lot of people who would like to change that. But as of right now, they haven't. And I don't. And I think the efforts that they have made to do so are too little too late. And that's kind of what's setting up this whole dollar milkshake theory. If they're printing so many dollars, why doesn't gold take, you know, why don't people just rush to gold? Right. And I, and I think that's the question you were asking. It's a question I'm asking myself is if there's so many fiat or fake, I call fake dollars, yeah. why doesn't gold go through the roof? Right? Yeah. Again, it kind of, I think it depends on where you're at and where you're, what currency you're denominated in. Like right. golden Argentino pesos looks really good right now. Right. <laughs> golden <laughs> Turkish lira looks really good. Golden, just about every currency other than the dollar is at its all-time high. And it's getting pretty close to itself in the dollar as being the all-time high as well. Still a couple hundred dollars away. In many ways, people think of the gold and the dollar as enemies or the, the antithesis of each other. I do think that we'll get into a period where they rise together. But I think ultimately gold will win the battle. Uh, the reason is because I think gold is the market's money. If we just had free markets and there was no government influence and central banks and you know legal tender laws, then I think the market would choose gold as money. But we don't live in a free market. We may want to, but we don't. And because of the you know the governments of the world, and not just the U.S. don't want a gold standard because they like to be able to spend more than they earn. Politicians get elected by making promises. And so I don't think the governments of the world want to go back to a gold standard. I think the market might force it on them, but they will fight it. And in that fight, I think that that's where gold gets kind of tampered down from time to time. I'd say that the main difference pre-corona and post-corona, from my point of view, is the extent to which the United States is gonna help mix the milkshake going forward. Before I thought that we might mix it a little bit and the rest of the world would continue to mix it a lot and we would suck it in. Well, now I think they're mixing it with them, but I still think for a number of reasons, the US is going to be the primary recipient of sucking in all that milkshake, all that liquidity that the rest of the world is, uh, and that we are now printing or the liquidity that we're putting into the market. So the world's printing money, but that's gonna flow to the US is what you're saying. Exactly, and so, and as that capital comes into the US, I don't just think it sits in cash. I think it gets uh, put into places that we yield a little bit more than cash. Maybe it goes into Coca-Cola, maybe it goes into IBM, maybe it goes into Electronic Arts or Microsoft, some of these companies um, that have some growth potential that maybe pay a dividend and think about it. It really depends on where you're sitting on how this works out. If you're sitting in Argentina and you have some excess savings and you can put it in the dollar and the Argentinian peso goes down 10%, you know, you've just made 10%. But if you also put it in Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola pays you a three or 4% dividend, now you've made 13%. And if Coca-Cola happens to go up 6%, now you've made 20%. So now you don't get that same thing if you're in the United States because the dollar is your currency. But my point is, is that whether you like it or not, the biggest demand for currency out there is the demand for the dollar. And despite the fact that they're printing a lot of it, the demand for it dwarfs the supply. 
And the and reason so, for that is much of the world's debt is also denominated in dollars. So they have to yeah. pay back the debt in dollars. Absolutely. Everybody knows that the U.S. is 24, 23, 25 trillion dollars in the debt. But what a lot of people don't know is that the rest of the world has an equivalent amount of debt. But if you actually drill down into corporates and some other, you know, the shadow banking system, it's probably 25 or 30 trillion dollars outside the United States that people that don't operate in the dollar owe in dollars. And again, when the demand for the dollar comes for paying the interest on those dollar loans and paying those dollar loans back. So the demand for dollars is kind of through the roof. So a quick question. Uh, So your thing is the dollar is going to get stronger. It's going to lift the U.S. economy and all our tangible assets here. But what is the demise? When's, when's well, I, I think ultimately the monetary system is just not designed for the dollar to get stronger. And as it does so, it's going to just wreck the global economy. I mean, I think the rest of the world is going to just go through really, 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 you know, difficult right. time. Right. And ultimately, that's not good for the U.S. either. So as the dollar continues to get stronger, despite the Fed's efforts to you know bring it lower, I think eventually the world will have to come together in another Bretton Woods type conference or another Plaza Accord type conference. And I think they'll have to either write debts down or introduce a new currency or reset the system in some form or another. And I think when that happens, that will be the point at which the dollar will start to lose value. That would be the point at which people no longer are rushing into the dollar and rushing into the United States. They're You know, maybe that's the time to go buy things in Canada or buy things in Australia or buy things in Argentina or buy things in Turkey, right? Uh, Because their assets will be very uh, discounted. And I think as capital then leaves the U.S. to go invest in those other places, that will cause the dollar to go down. The capital is running out of the dollars. which is Exactly. You were talking about cash flow. Nothing is more important than cash flow. If cash is flowing in, you're in good shape. And if cash is flowing out, that's a bad thing. And so, you know, as capital rushes into the U.S., I think that'll be good for the U.S. Eventually, when it runs out of the U.S., I think that will be bad for the U.S. I just don't think we're there yet. The whole COVID virus has caused uh, global trade, global travel, global movement to, you know, to stop. And that means the same for the velocity of money. So there's never enough money in the system to pay all the debt. So money has to circulate at a certain level of speed in order to service all the debts that are out there. When money velocity falls, money doesn't circulate, people miss their payments, defaults happen, and you get a contraction. That's a credit contraction. And so what the central banks do is they pump liquidity in to try to counteract that lack of velocity. And so what I think with this COVID and the lack of uh, the flow of money is making the global economy come in under even more pressure than it was before. It makes it even harder to get those dollars to service that dollar debt. And so I think it's kind of accelerating the downside of the milkshake. But here's the flip side, is they're going to print all these dollars and all this currency, right? And so when the COVID does leave and money is start to flow again, now you've got a lot more money out there and now it's flowing. So that's a recipe for inflation. But first you get the deflation, you print all the money. And then when the money starts to move, you get high levels of inflation because there's so much liquidity now. What's your forecast for European zone with the euro? Yeah. And you have the English and you have the Japanese. What do you see in each country? So I think the euro is probably going to go away or it's not going to continue to exist in its current form. I think on a price basis, it goes to at least 80. So it probably goes down 25 or 30 percent from here. I think the yen, the yen might be, I think the yen is going to go to at least 150, maybe to two. It's going back to where it came from. Yeah, exactly. I mean, essentially, I think the dollar is going to go back to its all time high. And I think the rest of the world's currencies, even the big ones, are going to get cut in half. So if you're living in Japan, that means life will get more expensive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Same as euro. Absolutely. And so that's what I say about gold. If you're not a U.S. dollar investor, you could probably back up the truck on gold right now. I think gold may still have a tough time in U.S. dollar terms. When everybody needs dollars, you sell whatever you can to get dollars. Outside of Japan, nobody needs yen. Outside of Europe, nobody needs euros. You know, outside of Argentina, nobody needs Argentinian pesos. But the whole world needs dollars. And how does, uh, or does it, does Bitcoin play into all this? Bitcoin's an interesting one. I own Bitcoin. I think if you have uh, the ability and you have some space in your portfolio for speculation, 
um, you know, you should own some Bitcoin. I don't think it replaces gold. I think it's, a, you know, you don't in addition to gold. It's a very asymmetric play. I think it probably either goes to a thousand dollars, which is be down, you know, or it goes to a hundred thousand or a million. And that, you know, so it's either all or nothing kind of a thing.